Hi, everyone. Thanks for the uh, opportunity to speak to you. So I'm going to uh, try to talk about some of the work that my group has been doing on kind of building a connections between theoretical research and practical uh, relevance. So let me just start by enumerating a number of the challenges we face in machine learning. Uh, scale, a huge challenge, right? The Sloan Digital Sky Survey in the first month of its existence had collected more data than the sum of all previous astronomical experiments. Uh, well, Feifei's group, as you saw, has been generating these gigantic image data sets. I mean, how, how many gigabytes do you guys have now in, in ImageNet? How big is ImageNet now? 15 million images, right? So that's big. Uh, we're getting all sorts of types of data, you know, social network data, things like that, that are a little, little bit unusual. This is a dating network from a high school. Um, I wish I had a laser pointer because there's some really good nodes in the network. Uh, <laughs> that are clearly not engineers, but I don't have a laser pointer, so you guys will have to come back and look for that. Uh, we face computational issues, you know, computational hardness. We want to compute things very efficiently. Uh, you know, as we collect more data, the sort of interaction that our algorithms kind of force upon participants, you know, privacy compromises, things like that, uh, start to come up, right? So in 2008, some uh, Nils Homer and some colleagues showed that just by using count data in genomics, you could actually figure out who belonged to different uh, medical studies. This caused the NIH to stop releasing data for a while, and that's kind of a problem, right? We need data from the NIH to be able to do things. Uh, and so what I try to do is, uh, there we go, uh, incorporate these kinds of issues into sort of analyses of machine learning algorithms and develop procedures that kind of automatically trade off between these different types of uh, difficulties and challenges. So the kind of classical view in statistics and machine learning is that we get more data and we get better performance, right? There's kind of two axes. Data set size grows, performance gets better. And I think uh, this is the wrong view to take now. We need to actually have a much kind of broader view, uh, either as theoreticians or as practical people. You know, it's not just how much data we've collected. There are additional things we have, right? So we want kind of these 3D or more pictures where we, we say, okay, we have, you know, multiple axes along which we want to measure performance. We want to have, you know, the, the amount of data we need to collect. We have, you know, our statistical performance, how, how good the inferences we make are. And then there's some other resource constraints or, or considerations that we want to take into account. This might be, you know, how much computation is it going to cost? How many icebergs are we melting by computing these things, right? Uh, I guess energy use does the same thing. Uh, we might care about, you know, how many sort of sensitive disclosures does our, do our machine learning algorithms make? Or how much, how much sort of sensitive data do we need to, to collect to actually do things? Uh, and so, whoops. So my research, you know, tries to make connections between machine learning, optimization, information theory, and statistics. And we, we try to take this sort of two-part view where we, we try to develop algorithms that kind of optimally do things, basically improve performance. So we want to, you know, push the performance up as high as we can, but we also want to understand fundamental limits so we can say, hey, look, you know, I've come up with a procedure and it's provably optimal, you know, and these understanding what these limits are will allow us to kind of, on the flip side, develop better procedures or know when it might be possible to develop a better procedure. So let me, um, you know, so there's a number of examples where this can happen, but let me dig into one, which is some of my work in privacy. So why privacy, right? There are many situations where we have data that you might want to keep private. You know, your genomic data, whether you use drugs, things like this, your financial status, financial information. Of course, there are many potential benefits, both policy and science-wise. You know, we might want to understand better biological bases of disease, do better epidemiological control, or make better economic policies. All right? And uh, so the big question here is what are the fundamental trade-offs between say, privacy and statistical utility. Now, let me start with a once provocative question. So I think this is no longer provocative after your boss, uh, I think his quote was, you know, of course, inhalation was the point, something like this. Is that right? Yeah, so this is not as provocative as it once was, but I'm going to uh, demonstrate a privacy-preserving procedure. So I'm going to roll this die, and if it comes up one or two, I'm going to lie when I answer this question to you guys. And if it comes up three, four, five, or six, I will tell the truth, right? So with probability two-thirds, I'm telling the truth. With probability one-third, I'm going to lie. But you guys won't know which one I'm doing, all right? So I just rolled the dice, and I have never smoked marijuana. 
I haven't, right? I, I mean, I haven't, at least according to what the dice said, okay? Anyway, so that, uh, that right there actually is an optimal way, sort of, at least from sort of the information we get for the statistics we want to compute, that trades off, you know, between preserving my privacy so you guys don't know whether I've actually smoked marijuana and, uh, you know, what we can actually compute. So to do this, you know, let me just touch a tiny bit on the model of privacy we're going to use. So we have, you know, the classic kind of machine learning or statistician or things like that setting is that there's your data X and then I, the statistician, get to see everything. But you guys don't trust me with good reason because I do machine learning, statistics, things like this. And so you say, you know what, I want some protection. So instead, you only let me see some kind of obfuscated data, All right? And formally what we say is, look, uh, I'm going to give you a guarantee that everything I do the probability I can distinguish you from some other person, given your obfuscated data, is less than one half plus a little fudge factor. So I'm almost basically guessing randomly whether the data came from you or not. And I can just do very, very slightly better than random. Okay, and then, you know, I won't get, and then, and then the goal is, you know, under these kinds of constraints, how do we develop optimal procedures? And I won't get into exactly what they are, but let me just give two vignettes, very brief ones. So, so here what I'm showing, is uh, we're trying to estimate the average salary of uh, faculty and students in the University of California system. Of course, this data is public, so it's pretty easy to actually do it, but just as a, you know, a proof of concept. And sort of the naive strategy, which is what people might use in these things before, your error rate, even with a sample of everyone in the UC system, you're off by about $1,000 in terms of the average salary, okay? The right way to do this is just to go person by person and ask, is your salary higher or lower than this, this number? All right, and then you let them flip a coin and they can lie to you sometimes. But you get the error to within like one dollar, okay? We can also do this with drug use, where we actually collected a bunch of data. I just wanna say that, uh, you know, we can, the optimal procedures are better. Let me just wrap up now. Uh, the, <laughs> Steve said my time was up, so I'm done. Uh, so basically, you know, what's the, what's the point of this? You know, theoretical ideas allow us to develop a lot of new optimal procedures. Gave one example application, there are lots of others. It's a very exciting area. Uh, and, you know, we're lucky to be here at Stanford where we have a lot of different people working on all these different things, a lot of fun interactions. So thanks, and uh, 